nosotros a los nuevos tiempos, reinventarnos, de desaparecer eh, para crear un nuevo sistema moderno y eficaz que ya se entiende por todas partes. Hi, welcome to the SciArc channel. I'm David Eskenazi, and today we're joined by Jing Wu from SoIl. It's the beginning of the year, and I was I was reading like the the office bio the other day, and I realized that you guys started in 2008, and so yes. this is like your 10-year anniversary. Anniversary, yes. That's kind of an interesting chapter to maybe reflect on. I don't know how much time you've had to actually think about it. Well, I think we started to feel, feel um, that we have entered, well, we have to enter a new chapter already two, three years ago. Mm. Um, that's why we um, really took the time uh, from the day job to produce the book that, um, that we've been kind of delaying and put off for, for so long. Um, so we came up with a book called Solid Objectives or the Edge Aura. And as the name suggests, it's a little bit of a birth cry, you know, mm. the, um, just put our name out there and it's a little bit of a manifesto without having a prediction of anything. Um, we thought it was due time for us to just reflect back um, of the last eight years at that point. Uh, we did a lot of internal discussions, but at the end of the discussion we said we're not going to redraw anything or reproduce any of the um, study models and we're going to put it all out there and try to be as honest as possible with the hmm. process. We started off pretty strong and we got PS1, which is the dream of every young architect. Yeah. I think the installation was also very successful in a way that it really changed the mood of the young practice at that time. It was hmm. 2008, everyone was depressed. Yeah. We, we just felt that this is a long game and mm -hmm. we want to stick around and um, you know, might as well just change the mood at the lowest point, um, so our PS1 installation was very much a playful, exploratory, colorful question of the modernism mm. as a project. I don't think that we had a clear agenda when we started. Um, it was more of intuition, but that project in a way cemented how we would exercise our intuition. And I think all the project that followed was very much influenced by that initial project. At the beginning of your practice when you guys did PS1, that you, you were sort of reacting to the recession, which seemed like not a great time to start, um, start a practice in general, but that you were ha having everything kind of this playful modernism right. idea. In 2008, we started our office, and uh, in 2017, we thought, okay, now we're going to take what we did and go on with that project and then make it bigger. And then the election and everything happened, and it was completely turned upside down and unsettled. I think last year, it took us a, a whole year to figure out what's that next step. And we took the project to a place where you could start to see architecture tactics and the tectonics, right? Um, and we wanted to take it, of course, to bigger arena and experiment with that project um, in the larger in front of the larger audience. So we started to participate in larger com competitions already. And we find ourselves always competing with very established companies. Um, we were in competition with OMA twice, SANA twice, you know, um, you know just people of our uh, father, mother's yeah. generation, yeah. right? That must be like uncomfortable or also an exhilarating? I don't know. It's exhilarating, yeah. um, but we are also very much aware of that we want to bring a different project. We don't want to just be the new kids on the block rehashing the same thing. Um, you talked about this playful modernism. I don't know if we, our project is modernism per se, but we definitely share some of a more kind of forward-looking and futuristic um, attitude. I think the modernism as a reductive attitude is doesn't hold, and we already know that for a very long time. It seems like maybe like the world today is very different than even ten years ago. It's just like mm -hmm. the politics out there right now are, seem very different. Um, we definitely have to um, face the mess that we have created environmentally, politically, and economically. Um, but if we just blame each other, there's no, you know, there's no way out. So I think for us, a lot of, in a lot of projects, we try to have a little bit more future 
forward-looking attitude. After some contemplation, we decided actively to work um, more on more projects in, um, in America, not on the East Coast, West Coast, but in the heartland of America. So we started to work in Ohio, we started to work in Omaha, some of the most economically depressed um, neighborhoods, and dealing with issues that, you know, at the foundation of a lot of the political stress of today. I think before we were a little bit uncomfortable going to those places because, you know, I'm foreigners from New York, you know, yeah. who am I to go and tell people what to do, right? Yeah. Um, but going to these um, neighborhoods and communities and working very closely with them, I realized that, that everyone is so open. Um, They're really grateful and, uh, you know, intelligent um, to welcome me and discuss things of their future and of their troubles with me. So I think hmm. that has been actually um, one great thing that came out of the election and that confrontation. Some of these bigger projects now that we're competing with, um, it's institutional, it's public projects, so the audience is much wider, mm. which means it includes audience um, that don't agree with each other. And how do you find a narrative that can have everyone get behind it. Um, hmm. For example, currently we're competing for a museum in Adelaide in Australia. Australia is also dealing with a lot of immigration issues, Aboriginal cultures, so how do you use the narrative of contemporary art to discuss and move some of this conversation forward? There is like, let's say, an aesthetic thread to the, to the work that seems relatively clear, like white seems pretty prominent. Mm. Um, meshes, nets, perforated materials, things that are transparent or translucent mm -hmm. in contrast to like the opaque surfaces. It seems like there is a kind of like image of, of, of blankness or of some sort of beauty that comes out of these things. I'm wondering, could you like articulate what that is or how you've seen it? It seems like it's also transforming as you guys go into more institutional work mm -hmm. from purely like tectonic and visual tactile effects to something something else maybe? Uh, I think we've always liked lightness and elasticity and uh, things that are un indetermined. We kept talking about the indeterminacy. I think, um, well, modernism is also a starting point for us in a way that um, we wanted to take something really pure. We're looking for something that's very kind of idealistic and pure and not forgetting that urge and hope for tomorrow is going to be better, yeah. but introduce contingencies and elasticities and variables in there. You know, mm. I think modernism was so unforgiving. Now we have gone through the postmodernism. We could kind of become make it more intelligent mm. so that it can incorporate multiple voices, multiple interpretations, and be yeah, be, be more forgiving. It seems like it's a way maybe also to bring people together around something. Like it, like you said, this sort of image of pure forms, like that there is an ideal, but we, mm -hmm. it's also impossible to make it perfect yeah. um, because perfection means something to different people. And so maybe there could be an ideal, but it's not quite there, mm -hmm. is, is a way to, let's say, have a conversation across different people because we don't, mm -hmm. everybody wants something perfect, but we can't agree on what that is maybe. And the tactility mm. has always also been really important for us because people can feel the same thing, although the way they express it might be different. If we can communicate through just tac tactile experience and spatial experience, um, maybe it has more potential. At the beginning of when we started talking, you were mentioning mood a lot, maybe the mood of architecture, the mood of the world, but also the mood of the work. Mm -hmm. And your monograph that you guys just wrote, like you said, is it's order, edge, aura. And I was thinking it's funny because order and edge you think of as like very standard architectural things. like we have order, we know what edges are, but mm -hmm. aura is this maybe um, other thing that maybe doesn't already belong to architecture or at least not commonly? Mm -hmm. Aura maybe kind of goes back to what I was saying that I think the language of architecture has so much more potential than just being didactic. I think when the architecture can uh, have a little bit more character, it might become a more empathetic, mm. you know, rather than just didactic and uh, kind of telling you what it needs to be, but I mean, like, be more has active, a, you know, like yeah. the effect, let's say. Yeah, right? it's like it has a personality <laughs> or something. It seems like, you, like there's a lot, a big push 
uh, to different kinds of media in the way that the work is represented. The videos seem very specific in the way that they're presenting the projects. Do you guys have like a like a attitude about that stuff, like how the work is represented or who's how you want people to see it outside of its own existence? It's always very difficult to represent architecture because it's so three-dimensional and yeah. in every architect's mind, you know, the, when you design, you walk through your space and there is a time lapse there. But then when you capture in a two-dimensional image, which is the predominant way that architecture has been represented, yeah. it just flattens everything. Mm. And I think the video it was just our way to say that, look, we have this available to us, so why don't we try to um, use that to, to represent the um, space that we create because we also get called a lot by our clients that why your space is so cold but they often say that when I go there it doesn't feel cold because huh. it is characterful yeah. right there is this translucencies and nuances but it's so hard to capture that so video is definitely a way for us to um, to capture that. We also try to establish an order that it's spatially felt. Um, so to walk through it, we're hoping mm. that rather than plan, that you have to, with your you know, brain, understand the plan. It's more kind of, if the video, you know, the camera is walking through the space, you can feel the plan even if you don't see it, right. or you don't understand it. Interesting. Yeah. For example, like the pole dance, Mm -hmm. um, like required video because it moved it was this sort yeah. of interactive thing and so it seems like um, almost from the beginning the project that you guys set out on like required other forms of representation other than mm -hmm. like static mm -hmm. uh, static things yeah w with pole dance we made a, actually a video for the presentation for the competition mm -hmm. I think at that moment it was still you know, big investment for a lot of people. So we made a video, and when we made that video, um, I think we were designing at the same time. So representation was the way that we designed. I'm curious about like just the image of the architect in general. Like I think it's something that we're all trying to change or sort of move forward. Even like the way that you guys are just represented, is it in the way how you sort of maybe are able to. Um, to author your own representation out there. In terms of image, yes, I mean there are a lot of um, duo these days. Our generations, all couples. Right. It was productive for us because architecture just takes so much um, commitment and the work. The role of collaboration is one of those things that I'm I'm very curious about in your work in particular. It seems like you guys collaborate with artists. You have obviously mm -hmm. people working with you. Well, collaboration is very important for us. I think uh, coming from the same philosophy that we don't want to work in a linear form and uh, we'll process. You know, we don't want to just say that you know set agenda and uh, go all the way to the end without questioning it, you know, having conversations with artists amongst ourselves mm -hmm. allows at any moment to be critical of each other. Mm. You guys have like a funny name, I think, mm -hmm. I, to me, you know, like so ill with like the hyphen in the middle. We all know SO means solid objectives, mm -hmm. it sort of stands for something, but it feels like overall the whole thing should stand for something mm -hmm. together. It's like there's two halves, but they're not the same category of things either that mm -hmm. you need to come together to produce the practice. Yes, there's two categories of things. One is people, one is um, agenda in a way, yeah. um, a project, solid objectives. If we're going to do a project, you know, if the office is a project, we better give it some kind of direction and mm -hmm. set some kind of course for it and so solid objective came out it was very much just intuitively okay you know there's the character and then the people and the journey of explorations and uh, and then there's also some kind of loose course and agenda and then but if you just put the two together somehow there's no synthesis so mm. we thought okay let's actually make a new word out of it and it turned out that, that soil also means something right yeah and it also means two things ambiguously mm. I'm curious like what what it is that you tell students or young architects younger than yourselves out there about starting a practice or the first 10 years well, I do think that if students want to start their own practice or be in architecture for a very long time sooner or later they have to find their own projects mm. so 
I'm very supportive and pushing and sometimes really hard on that as well. Like, okay, ju don't just do what I tell you to do. I can give you all the references and all the metaphors, but in the end, you have to figure out what's your project. If something is considered and thoughtful and you have really stick with it, it shows. Yeah. yeah, there are portfolios that maybe have a much more build work, but things are just scattered and you can tell that something has given in, <laughs> you know. Mm -hmm. It's very easy to tell and there are projects that you know that they never lose that focus, but the project is always there. Yeah. I think it's it, it really easy to spot. What are the, the issues that you guys are now confronting that you haven't before, but also that you think other architects, like architects in general maybe, should be confronting more? I think one specific typology is that we've been doing more and more these days, and we've been trying from the beginning, but it never really succeeded, is housing mm -hmm. and houses and more domestic space. And uh, that is a project that we really, I personally feel that the architects don't deal with it enough, or even when you build it, there's not enough push to really have a paradigm shift mm -hmm. there. It's so much connected to the, our security of human being and our identity. So if you don't have a place to live where you don't feel good about the place that you're living, um, it, it, it's kind of a chain effect. It can affect so many things, aspect of your life. Our society is not poor, you know. We, we have so many technologies and we have so much money in the hands of too few people. Yeah. That like a house as a, a domestic space, as a project should not be so besieged by what we're facing. And mm. I think for the housing project in um, Paris, for example, um, it's very exciting. The um, Paris project is on the ax very important axis of the Bastille, right? right. Um, and I think all the other competitors put a big building there, but we are the only firm that said, uh, well, team said that, you know, let's keep this view and this important axis for the city. So when this whole area gets, um, uh, transformed, the land is still it's owned by the people. So we only took the small lot um, on the side and only putting um, co uh, co-working and incubator space and public um, mm. amenity space there um, to aid the transformation of the neighborhood rather than just boom put a big housing project there. Mm. Well, it sounds like then you guys are also just thinking about like how this is going to grow over time, mm. how where people are gonna deal with this in, like you said, like maybe 10 or 15 years. Is that something you guys have confronted in other projects or is this really like the first one where you're really thinking at that kind of time scale? I think time has always been in part of our consideration. I mean, the project we are working on in Omaha, which we have been kind of thinking a lot of how do you attract new people, retain, you know, um, talents from the neighborhood. So we're putting like artist studio in there, we're putting cafe, the only cafe in the neighborhood in there. So just kind of making a community. So yeah, I think a lot of this project, we're starting to think about how can the project be the hinge point for a different thinking. You know, like housing is not just production. It has a function in how the society transforms right. itself. We're trying to do project of libraries in these days. Mm. In a way, library for me, it's in the middle of museums and uh, housing. Mm. It's for the people who live there. You know, yeah. museum in a way have to take that local conversation to a global conversation. Um, but library is really serving the you know, residents. So, you know, there's the housing, there's the library, and then the museum. For me, it's very much a kind of a scaffold that they really lock into each other. So we're branching out slowly from, you know, our first playful ambition and see how that can engage those full spectrum of our life. Thanks for coming to SciArc. Um, yeah. It's really nice to have you all. Thank you. Yeah.